everybody welcome to the faith and fandom podcast uh part of the love thy nerd podcast network uh where you can find lots of nerdy faith promoting faith adjacent and all overall jesus podcast podcasts over on that network lots of cool stuff there and uh you can also find us on the glue network on roku i'll mention that at the end as well but thanks for joining in today i am joined by nathan webb of checkpoint church hi dude how you been <laughs> oh i'm doing good i'm glad to be here um you and i first uh podcasted it uh 2021 mm-hmm. and uh i think at that point in time you in that conversation was the first time i'd ever heard like someone actually verbally speak of digital church um mm. in that context like you were the the pioneer of that at least for my bubble so tell like for the people that don't know who you are and everything tell what checkpoint is what you do what that life is like Sure. So I'm out of the mainline tradition. I'm a United Methodist elder. And so at the time that we met back in 2021, I would have been going through the process that we call provisional orders, um, where I was pursuing becoming an elder, but I wasn't yet in full connection. And uh, I grew up a major nerd and my dad is a pastor. And I was one of those pastor kids that actually like really liked church. And so I had this really positive experience with church, but I never really felt like I was able to be my nerdy self. And so then whenever I uh, experienced a call to ministry, I started to really wrestle with like, what does it mean that I didn't feel welcomed as a nerd? Maybe it was just my one-off experience. But then whenever I went to undergrad, I discovered that that wasn't the case and that in fact, nerds just weren't really welcome in the church, maybe as a fallout from the standing panic, or maybe it was just kind of a bias that they would be well-suited to the sound booth. And that was about it. Um, But then at some point I, I realized, hey, maybe there could be something here. And so in 2020, I uh, finished up seminary and just wanted to get like a bug in the ear of our church developers in the conference and just kind of let them know who I was and a vision that I had for the future. I thought maybe I'll plant a church in five to 10 years. Um, But lo and behold, the church developer in the conference was a major nerd and uh, had played D&D with his college buddies for 20 years after college and like just loved it, uh, absolutely enjoyed every minute of it and got what what I was trying to do. Um, that conversation happened in February of 2020 and then March of 2020 happened. So, uh, we pretty quickly <laughs> surprised to pivot. Yeah. yeah. So originally the pitch was not for a digital church. Um, we wanted to do something very similar to what love thy nerd does at cons. We wanted to kind of go serve at cons and, and be present in those spaces and just get to know them. And of course I thought this, I was the first one that had ever thought of this before discovering how many Every, others had done it. Everybody thinks uh, they're the first one. Yeah. But I, I got into it and um, wanted that. And then March happened and we had to pivot and revision. And so the question that I asked was, where are the nerds if they're not at con? And the answer was they're on Twitch. So we started streaming on Twitch and wanted to uh, meet people there and still didn't have the vision for the digital church. We kind of just wanted to gather people online, um, but still kind of envisioned like, what about a game shop? Um, that, you know, the front is a game store and that sustains the ministry. The back is a church and that, uh, enlivens the people. Um, and still we were stubborn. And then we just discovered we had a thing on Twitch that was happening, happening and people were forming and a community was forming. And so they taught me about discord. I had never heard of discord and, uh, I discovered that it was the coolest thing I could have possibly dreamed of. And the more and more that I've gotten into it, the more and more convinced I am that it is, uh, not just a. Uh, satisfactory form of church, um, but is a true uh, exemplary form of church. Uh, And so we have a digital church building on Discord that we call Checkpoint Church, and that is where we gather 24-7 in what I like to kind of uh, don a neo-monastic expression of church. We are doing what the monks did. We really are gathered 24-7 on Discord, um, but we're just online instead of in uh, in the monastery. But it's it's an interesting and fascinating thing that we've built over the course of these past four years and um, wanted to discover how to do discipleship through there. And that led us to YouTube and the folks wanted to learn how to serve. And that led us to a thing that we call level two, which is just a level of service within our community. And we needed moderators. So we created the guardians and the next thing we decide we need, we're going to create as well. We're very adaptable and uh, a scrappy, scrappy bunch continuing to learn uh, what does it mean to be um, church that is happening digitally. So I know like I've seen you post different numbers stuff and I know everything's not numbers based and everything. Um, 
I've seen you post different number stuff and had conversations with you over the times. Um, how many like leaders slash elders, deacons, whatever you would like make the label as how many people are like uh, beside you serving with you to make this happen? Oof, it's such a tough question. So as far as staff, like paid people, it's just me. Yeah, um, and I'm, I'm appointed. Knew, I knew that part. <laughs> I'm appointed to the thing, and we have not figured out sustainability enough to the point where we're able to hire somebody. But, um, and I've I've mentioned this to the powers that be within the UMC. Um, it, we're really we're past the point of needing another pastor. Like it, we are to the point that if if a church was the size that we are in a physical brick and mortar traditional style, um, then it would be baffling that they have one pastor and no administrator and no fill in the blank because we are uh, far beyond the numbers of the point that we need that. Um, purely based off of leaders. So I mentioned we have this thing called level two and all of that requires is that people let me know that they want to serve the space. So whether that means they're leaders in the space is kind of up to them how they take that service. But the people that have opted in to say, I want to help like serve this community and be a part of this community on more than just a consumer side, um, we're in the numbers of like the low 30s. Um, and that's where we've gotten. So some of those are so involved. They are there every single day. They're my you know right-hand man. They're my people that are right there uh, helping me do what needs to get done and uh, serve in the space regularly and moderate the space regularly. And then there are others that are a part of it because they just want to know more and then they're curious about how they can serve and and respond to some posts on discord so it runs the full gamut and i don't really have a full number of like who does what necessarily but that's about about where we're at and so that's per person right our our discord is is a little uh, a little over 600 at this point so that is a bafflingly small number to a huge community that needs more people there that are just there to serve it um, and a lot of that is because of a recent boom that we had. And so that recent boom in numbers has kind of led to us not scrambling, but to us really being insistent about like, Hey, if you feel led to serve this community, like we need you, <laughs> like it's, it's time. Um, if you've at all felt like you are, are in this space to be more than just a consumer of the space, then it's, it's, it is the moment. And, uh, we could really use all the help we can get and making sure that we're adequately serving, loving, uh, the nerds, geeks, and gamers in the space. Based on the people that you do have currently serving, um, what do you feel like would be your max capacity of people you could effectively minister to? Ooh, now that's an interesting question. And it would be like, what does ministry even mean at that point? Right. Um, like the pastoral ministry, then the rule of thumb, I can't remember what, is it like Dunbar's number or something? There's some number out there that is like a pastor should serve like at most 150 people. Yeah, um, and that is like that's like the capacity for a pastor. And so, as soon as you get over 150 people that are there to be pastored, uh, you need another pastor to handle the to to share the load. Um, and so, I I don't know. I feel like personally, um, I'm at, I'm I'm at capacity. Uh, I'm doing the best that I can to uh, all the new people that we get try and engage them in a serious and intentional way. But between all the other things that are happening. Um, it, it's it's tough and I'm stretched pretty thin and I have to be pretty rigid with my boundaries. And I'm thankful my wife is very good at boundaries and being a PK, I'm very good at boundaries because I saw what it did to my dad. Um, but that doesn't make it necessarily the easiest thing in the world. Uh, I just have to, I have to do it for my own mental health and for my, my familial health. Um, the reason I say it's tricky is because of the internet uh, and because of what I just experienced with this video. So I mentioned the boom and uh, I'll try not to talk about it too much because I feel like it's all that I've talked about. It got to the point where I apologized on Facebook because I was like, I'm posting about this every day and I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, I feel like y'all are getting annoyed at how much and they, nobody was, was telling me I was being annoying, but I was like, if I saw somebody who only talked about one thing, I would probably be uh, irritated. So I maybe read a little bit too much into my own biases, but. We had a video that popped off to the point of uh, making us YouTube partners pretty much overnight. Um, and we reached, I think we're at 180,000 views on that video, um, which for comparison's sake, our highest our highest viewed video um, before this one was at 6,000 views. So that we went from 6,000 views being our absolute cap of all caps to now 180,000 plus views. Um, it's insane, the growth that we've experienced. But what really has struck me and has caused me to kind of question the 
um, the power of the internet to do ministry is the comment section. Uh, if you go through and scroll through the comments of this video, we have nearly 1300 comments uh, on this one alone. And um, just for context, it's on the television show Has Been Hotel from Amazon, um, which is a really risque theme. Um, it is it is a challenging story. It is not something that is comfortable for Christians. And so a lot of Christians uh, lashed out against it uh, on YouTube. And so what happened was I presented a really just equitable viewing of it. I don't think I praised its, uh, you know, glories or anything, but I, I just tried to approach it in a fair manner and was like, Hey, maybe we're overreacting a little bit church. Let's try and just enjoy this media for what it is. Uh, and whenever I did that, it just struck people as like, finally, a pastor is seeing me for me. Finally, a pastor is meeting me where I'm at. Um, I read comments that said, uh, I would have never left the church if this had been the church that I was a part of. Um, if somebody had treated me this way, then I can't tell you how much it would have meant to me back in those days before um, the, the church hurt me. And so there was so much visceral church hurt uh, and kind of a, a an ex-church experience that was so soothed by this random video um, that I really didn't even talk about it that much in there. Uh, there were just people that were comforted in a way that somebody was willing to hear them uh, and be there for them in the media that they love and that they enjoy. Uh, and that has been a real game changer. Like I, if, if you had asked me before this video, I probably would have said just 150 people. It's how many I can serve as a pastor. And I think that's true. But Checkpoint Church has a unique capacity uh, being an internet-based church to reach a dramatically larger audience of people who really need to hear um, our message that they matter to God and that we believe that nerds, geeks, and gamers truly do matter and are worthy of God's love and are worthy of being told that. One of the things that kind of, that one of the things I've tried to really kind of keep reminding myself and grasp being in this nerd ministry space is um we're called to different congregations and different people for different mm -hmm. purposes. Um, like I've never been on Twitch like at all. And I know you like live there and mm -hmm. uh, not like and, Jay, <laughs> not like Jay live. I'm, I'm still, I'm still, I, I bow to sensei there with the ones that yeah. are streaming, you know, 10 to 12 hours a day. I'm, I, I humbly concede that one. <laughs> and that's the thing, you know, even with talking with Jay before, I was just like foreign concept, no idea. Mm -hmm. I was like, and, you know, even like with your response to Discord, I still feel like an elderly man trying to find my <laughs> notifications because like even I mentioned that something about Discord before it got started and I'm literally like, where do I go? Um, <laughs> but uh, one thing that's like, I was happy for you when your has been video popped off mm -hmm. because you're in a different space than I am in some capacities. Um funny thing i had a has been video experience that was like a thousand percent the other direction mm. but i'm also not mad at it um because we we reach different people um right. i do a little friday morning uh hey here's some news from this week thing just while i'm drinking my coffee before i leave on friday mornings and i do like a little facebook live video for that and it was the week has been hotel was dropping and i said oh hey by the way um has been hotel um is going to drop on amazon next week and i got just for announcing that it was existing um mm. i got a loving reprimand mm. uh from somebody and here's the thing i know the person a thousand percent meant well and i was like okay i appreciate your perspective with that noted um but it's just like i mentioned it once and like was like whoa <laughs> And I was like, look at how different people respond in these capacities. Sure. And with that, and one of the things too, that I saw the most, I went to a Comic-Con in Lexington, Kentucky, mm -hmm. and it was almost a completely unofficial has been hotel con. Oh, how about that? <laughs> that um, sounds overwhelming. <laughs> well, we have so, a lot of them in our discord, I'm sure. Um, so the bottom floor, the, the con was three floors. Mm -hmm. Um, bottom floor was celebrities, your big ticket people. The middle floor was panelists and all your panel rooms. The second floor or the top floor was just artist alley vendors. 
and the entire cast of Hasbin Hotel. Oh wow. Like I'm talking giant wall displays, like the front of the hotel, like everything. And like the entire cast was all there. And so the majority of the cosplayers were all has been hotel. And the whole time I was sitting there, I was like, you know, they'd enjoy his video. <laughs> and I recommended yeah. it a handful of times at the show, um, you know, to the people that talked with it. But it's and that's just one of those things that people like if they have the thought, the apprehension that they're going to be prejudged before they get the chance. Mm. You know, and I think that's the good thing about like what your video did and like what so many of these ministries that are out there are doing is like kind of taking away the prejudging to say, hey, I'm willing to meet you where you are. Um, yeah. And uh, there's a dude in my community who re I, I know he reads every post I post. I know that he's like follows everything I do. Um, not a supporter, but he follows. Um and I went to an open mic night uh, at a coffee shop recently and just did a poem about collecting vinyl. And he's like, you went up there and you didn't talk about Jesus. I was like, mm -hmm. yeah. I was like, yeah, I just wanted to be a part of the, the art space. He's like, cool. I've had more conversations with that guy since then <laughs> than the like decade prior. Um, oh, yeah. And that's, I really appreciate the fact you're meeting people the way you are, where you are. Um, sure. What would you feel like is your, if that's one of your, your biggest pop-offs, which by the way, you mentioned it and I haven't honestly paid attention in real life terms lately. How far do you have to go to be a YouTube partner? For those uh, listening? So there's a, there's a couple requirements out there. And the big one was 4,000 watch time hours. And so we were like, we'll never get there. We've been on YouTube for four years and uh, you got to have 4,000 within the, the span of 12 months. And so the highest we ever got, even when we were making the most content and getting the most views was somewhere under the 2000 marks. We were barely halfway. Um, so once you reach a thousand subscribers uh, and then you have to get so many watch time hours and then you have to apply. And so we, uh, you know, like I said, it was overnight that that video went from, you know, bringing us up 2000 hours to 4000 hours to 8000 hours to uh, hundreds of hours, you know, more than that. At this point, we just keep growing and growing and it keeps being seen by more and more people. Uh, and so that's the real requirement is like, not only can you get enough views and subscribers, but can you get people to actually watch? Because yeah. if you just get views and it's only three seconds. Nobody cares. Right. Um, that's the issue with shorts. And that's why shorts have kind of reframed YouTube in a way, um, which we're, if we were to base off of shorts or any of our other videos other than this one, we still wouldn't even be close. Um, it really is. It, it was an overnight success situation with this one. That's one of not, I'm not mad at it because it was a job. And you, when you take a job, you, you know what you're getting into. Um, my most successful content of my life probably um, is stuff that, will never benefit me past the paycheck I got. Mm -hmm. Um, I was a screenwriter for a short window well, two years of, uh, for, uh, clever movies, screen junkies, uh, fandom entertainment. They've kind of like all mm -hmm. absorbed each other at different points. I have like 12 videos with over 3 million views each. Mm -hmm. Um, but my name's nowhere to attached to it. Right. It's like, yeah, it nice. is a thing. And it's, it's almost like when it, when it happens to you, it's this stunning, like shock and awe that lasts for like a week and your stomach just kind of doesn't settle for like a week. Yeah. And then as soon as it's over, you realize that like the dust settles and absolutely nothing about your life has changed. Um, you know, granted, I think that with this one in particular, like our discord has grown. And so things are kind of irrevocably changed for checkpoint, but for me, like it hasn't really changed my life at all. We had a video back in our very first year on TikTok that went viral. Um, and it was me learning that you could use the move cut in the overworld in Pokemon and I freak out and, uh, and people loved it. And so we got a million views on that and it was, you know, so unimportant, so incredibly unimportant. But it was while it was happening, it was the most exciting thing in my life. And so it, 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 I, there's like a, a weird nature of this internet virality. And I have to so regularly humble myself and just kind of remind myself, hey, I am not a streamer. I am not a content creator. 
I am the pastor of this church that makes content and streams. Like mm. it's, 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 it's an important kind of gut check that I have to give myself regularly, but I, I would be lying if I said it wasn't a thing that just kind of messes you up um, for a good week after it happens. I, I had a, and the, the two, like between TikTok and Facebook, my two most viral things are stupid things that have no effect on the ministry that I'm doing. Right. And I'm like, and I'll like, I'll make something dumb and I'm like, man, if this was attached to my ministry, I'd be really grateful. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. uh, do you remember, uh, I think it was a song by Bad and Bougie or it was something, I mean, it was like uh, people were making memes of raindrop, drop top. Mm-hmm. It's like, I made one of Oh Brother or Art Thou. It's like raindrop, drop, drop, drop top. Oh, George, not the livestock. <laughs> um, 78,000 shares wow. in a week. In like Facebook terms, that was, I was like, oh, great. <laughs> right. like, but um, so success in the things that aren't re- necessarily kingdom focused are easily distracting, mm-hmm. but not fruitful. Um past just that connection like what do you feel like the most fruitful thing you do is hmm i mean i think it the most fruitful thing that i think that checkpoint does is our so we end every um every nerdy sermon every stream every podcast anything that we do we try to end it with three things that we believe to be true about every single person um, that is watching listening etc whatever uh, you want to put behind the particular piece of media that it is and this was intentional from day one and we have made sure to keep doing it um, we always end it with God loves you we love you you matter um, and those are going to be the three things that if you know anything about Checkpoint, I want to make sure you know those three things. I want you to memorize those three things. And w- I want it to be almost synonymous. If I could change our name to that, maybe I would, because I want that to be what you think of when you think of Checkpoint. Uh, and I think that that message in particular was so crucial to our nature as a church plant, because I didn't want to be a church plant that was um, more of a church transition uh, where people would go to the next new and hot and exciting thing. I wanted to genuinely reach new people. And so whenever I planted, I was like, well, I need to reach people that don't know that they matter. Uh, I need to reach people that have heard from Christians that they don't matter to God. And I need to tell them that that's wrong and that I'm an ordained pastor telling them that they do. And so that was an incredibly important feature that we've held strong on for almost five years now. And so I think that is probably the most important thing to me that we've done um, is we have consistently and unabashedly um, been a, a genuinely welcoming community that has hopefully pushed the the marker a little bit on letting people know um, that that we really do believe those three things to be true about them. We had one comment, so I have a whole I have a whole spiel um, because you know I, I have had oh, to become a streamer. Yeah. Yeah. So I have the spiel, but there's one thing that I say. I say that we believe this, we believe these three things to be true about every single one of you out there. And then I say, whether you believe in God, don't believe in God, go to church, don't go to church, hate God or hate church. I still believe these to be true. And somebody in the comments was a little smarmy uh, of the, of the has been video and was like, thank you for giving me permission to hate God. And uh, they were being, you know, a little tongue in cheek, but I responded to their comment in a video and was like, yeah. Yeah, I did. Like, I didn't give you permission exactly, but I sure did name it that it's okay that you hate God and that God still loves you despite that um, and that you matter despite that and that there is still grace abundant for you despite that. Uh, And that's an important point. And so, you know, it's, it's things like that, but it's making sure that like, um, I, I don't want to always necessarily be like saying the radical thing, but there are certain things that I think are um, extremes that we should uh, exemplify and let people know um, that we really are living a holy and set apart life. And a part of that holy and set apart life is that we really do believe in a God that, that, that died for all of our sins and a God that does offer grace for all, that atones everything, including um, a hatred before we understand what we're even doing. Um, and, you know, do I, do I deep dive into the theology of it every time I say it? No, but I say it because it gets people's attention um, and hopefully lets them know that maybe if it's just in the back of their mind, uh, they know in that moment that they truly do matter. And that's the kind of stuff that will have lasting, like, 
triggers and memories for people when they have the fears and doubts and things. I had uh, at that same has been con that I was at. Um, I had a mom just burst into tears mm-hmm. at my booth because she looked down at my little sticker display and I'd made a VeggieTales centric sticker that just had a mm-hmm. tomato and in the tomato it says, God made you special and he loves you very much. And, you know, just because for the VeggieTales fans that were throwback people there and she read that, she's like, I haven't heard this in so long and just started bawling mm. um, because like she's like, <laughs> and we just got into a conversation about she's like, you know, I always believed that it was like I knew a animated tomato was telling me, but I believed it. <laughs> um, oh. And, you know, when people can come to believe that, I think one of my. It's probably one of my turning points of just realizing the effectiveness of what this type of ministry can do is um, we were at a, and I've, I've mentioned this one a lot. It's just like one of those poor memory moments was a, there was a young lady cosplaying as Deku. We were at the biggest show in North Carolina at that point. Uh, well, maybe not at that point, but galaxy con Raleigh at that, you know, at that time there was a street preacher outside condemning everybody that walked in. Um, and telling them, you know, if they cosplay, they're going to hell. If you go into that building, you're going to hell, et cetera, et cetera. And this young lady, uh, came up to me and in tears, <laughs> ruining her little green makeup that was, you know, around her eyes and everything. She's like, I just need to know if God actually hates me. Mm. And still like that was five years ago. And we're still like connected via Instagram and, her life choices and, you know, where she's at, you know, don't always line up with everything I'm sharing, but she still connects with that. And I think, I think that's one of the, I think that's why con life and so much of online online life is people just want to find places. They feel like they actually are welcomed, not just told that they're welcomed. Um, And that makes a big deal. So, if that's what you feel like you do, like most fruitful, what just to ask you this and uh, what do you feel like has been your like, not necessarily biggest fail, but of just like tried it. It's not the right route. You know, like, oh, yeah. have you had any of those? You know, uh, I really love the idea of streaming video games for the purpose of Bible study. I really like that idea. And it just doesn't work. Um, We've tried it so many times. I've brought it back so many times. I have been so intentional about uh, doing it in different ways and shapes and forms. And it just plain old doesn't work. We we kicked off um, our our ministry back in 2020 by playing one of my favorite games of all time, Undertale. And we played Undertale uh, together on stream. And then I invited them to a Zoom call where we would talk about the kind of Bible study themes that I brought up during that time. And, uh, you know, nobody came on Sunday because of course they didn't, because I was asking them to go from an anonymous chat box to a zoom call over the course of four days. Like that was way too big of an ask. And I know that now, but then I tried again with life is strange and tried to make it a little bit different where they come to our discord and just kind of engage in it. It never worked. And so what we, what we wound up pivoting to was these nerdy sermons where I will, Instead of expecting somebody to play through the entirety of a game or watch the entirety of a show with us, instead, I just kind of present a theme from the show, game, or fill in the blank, and then present a biblical truth that's typically pretty light, um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, it's a passage of scripture and it is exegeted well. And then I use those two things in tandem to kind of tell a good story that tells us how we can live more Christ like today. And that is what turned out to be something very much more formative. Um, than the the failure of asking people to do the hard work of um, studying exegesis live with me. Uh, that that just never, it never panned out as I wanted it to. And I still have dreams for that to be like a, a thing that could be done, but I just, it just has not worked yet. Um, I have like strains of thought. So whenever I might be playing a game live, I'll say something that brings a scripture to mind or brings a truth to mind or something along those lines. But the days of trying to do a, an intentional Bible study stream, um, it just, it doesn't work 
it doesn't work for our community anyway. I know some people will do not just a game, but they'll just bring up scripture and, uh, and read through scripture on a stream. And even that is just not our steez. It doesn't, it doesn't work for the environment that we've, we've got going on. And that's no shade to those that do. Um, but it just, it, our, our people are still dealing with the hurt and the trauma so bad that they just want to work through some of the basics and start to learn how to live a holier life before they're ready to really do the, do the hard work of diving through the scriptures. We're just about to start a Bible study and um, it's totally on discord. It's totally asynchronous. And we're just going to use the revised common lectionary and read four passages together a week and talk about it as we can. Um, but that's taken us almost five years uh, to get to the point that we have a, a large enough group that's ready to start talking about just intentional study of the scriptures beyond um, uh, viewing them in the light of a trending video game or anime. Uh, it took a lot of time but we've gotten to the point that now I feel like we're able to do it a little more. Okay. Uh, one thing that I saw you post about recently and I thought it was just really neat. Um, tell people about your, uh, I'm going to call them the wrong things, but the boxes you're putting together of the elements. And yeah. Things. It's the checkbox. I love puns. I really like puns. I like anything that is even slightly punny. And so checkpoint sending out the checkbox brings me a lot of joy. Uh, so whenever we started, um, like I mentioned, we're a church plant. And so unapologetically from day one, I've wanted to be a church. Um, in the UMC, we have these things called extension ministries. Uh, we have fresh expressions. We have all sorts of ways that church can kind of happen in a church adjacent way. Um, but I, I kind of have an ulterior motive of like, I want to prove to the UMC at large that digital ministry is possible. Uh, and that digital church planting is possible. And so from the beginning, I've had the intentionality of like, well, if the church can do it, then we can do it too. Uh, and we've managed to really recreate the church experience as a whole, except for the two things that we had trouble with, uh, which were the sacramental authority things. Um, we were having trouble with communion and we still have trouble with baptism. And so we, we were re reaching a point of like, we need to do something. People want communion. We didn't have anybody that was a, a new believer that wanted to be baptized. Um, we maybe have had people that are like expressing interest and reaffirming within the circle of checkpoint because they feel like they've renewed their faith. Um, but for the most part, like that's not been a concern, but communion was. And so what we started to talk about was, well, how, what is communion? How does that work? And what can we do to make it meaningful? And so we practiced a couple times within some of our leadership of like, well, what if, uh, what if we just get together and you bring something that's juice like and something that's bread like, and we just come up with some kind of liturgy and do some kind of thing. And we try to make it feel like communion and, uh, and it was okay. It felt all right. Um, it didn't really have any kind of like transcendent experience to it. I didn't really feel like at the end of the day, what I felt like, it felt like we were trying to do what a brick and mortar church does online. And that's never been our style. Um, we want to do what feels natural for the group that's being built there while still honoring the sacramental uh, expectations of remembering Christ's sacrifice and living into the body of Christ. So we're like, well, what does that mean? Um, how can we celebrate the unity of communion? And so what we decided on was the checkbox. Um, we wanted to have all of the elements uh, of, the, of the bread and the juice sent from our central location of this office that I'm in right now. This is the space where we stream from. This is the space where we gather. Um, we wanted some kind of tangible element to it. And so I started to send out the, the, the juice and the bread. And I also would send out uh, a handwritten note or a little gift or some candy or some snacks or some, uh, you know, uh, whatever that I could come up with some, some checks mix or trail mix or anything that I had nearby. And I would send them in these little boxes in a way that might make People feel like, oh, my pastor knows me. My pastor sent this to me, and this is coming directly from, from the space that we've gathered for the past several years. Uh, and so that was half the battle, is that we wanted to have some way to create a tangible uh, expression within our digital church. Uh, and then we revamped the liturgy. So it's still the same old, same old liturgy. We're still doing the epiclesis. We're blessing the elements. We're doing all the things that the United Methodist Church expects of us um, within our kind of 
uh, rites and rituals. But we've also added an element um, where I broadcast on like a Zoom call, on a Discord call, I broadcast our logo. And after we've already blessed the elements, I ask everyone, traditionally during the time that you would come up and actually get the bread and juice, I ask everyone to place their thumb or their hand or whatever, if they're using a, a phone or a, a screen, place their, their hand or their thumb on the symbol. And then I just read out uh, almost like a poem, um, just a short little homily where I kind of express that right now we are all touching the same broadcast symbol from one space. By all um, intents and purposes, in this moment, we are literally connected via a broadcast symbol. We are touching the exact same space at the exact same time. I say that it's, it's the closest thing we can experience to holding hands while we take communion. Uh, and then I ask them to, to, you know, this is the body broken for you. Uh, and this is the blood shed for you. And we consume the elements there together as we are holding hands, uh, via the symbol. And so that's what I mean by like, uh, I didn't want to just recreate the church experience, but instead I wanted to live into what is a calling of digital ministry. Um, what does it mean to be people who connect better over the internet than we've ever connected in person? Because Lord help me, if I have to go to another thing in person, um, I'm the most uncomfortable one in the room. Uh, and I've found a people that are just like that, that have the same sense of social anxiety, but you put me in a chat box and I'm going to be an absolute social butterfly. Uh, and so what does it mean to not just let those people gather and live the same experience, but instead to live the experience in the way that edifies and builds up the body um, of digital people gathered? Uh, and so that's been a really intriguing experiment. We continue to work with it and expand upon it. We've used it now as a form of not just um, – the, the, the checkbox is always free, so we don't charge anyone for the elements. Um, we do give people the option to cover postage if they'd like to. But then we are trying to use it now as also a means of further um, celebration and also sustainability of the thing. And so if people want to pay a little extra for a premium box, um, we'll still ship them the elements for free if they want them. But if they want a little special gift, then they can, and we can uh, take an extra donation there. Um, but that's just another means by which we're able to further experience some kind of tangibility. Uh, and we started having these man and mingle and DLC events where we, um, we have special guests that'll come on and talk to us about things and uh, help us work through things. And I try to theme the box around those things so that it's even deeper of a level of community that we're creating. Um, so yeah, it's been a fascinating thing and we're about six months into it at this point and people just keep on signing up more and more. Uh, they get excited for it. They're looking forward to it. They just express to me how special it makes them feel in that moment, how connected it makes them feel in that moment. Um, and most importantly for me and the the powers that be as a as a church formation, um, we're feeling more like the church than we ever have before um, because we are truly taking that that sacrament together twice a month. I know some churches that take it every six months. We take it twice a month. <laughs> so, I mean, um, we're, we're living into that church experience and trying to really do something special there. Um, on the church connection level, um, do you have any hesitancy being attached to a specific denomination? Like, do you feel like checkpoints attached to a specific denomination or that's just where you come from or like, like what's, what's your feelings there? Yeah. We're, so we are, we are a church plant out of the United Methodist church. That's, that's what um, I thought, but you know, just checking. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So that is, that's how we express it. I'm very much, you know, we're a connectional um, church. And so we're, we're very much like a uh, umbrella kind of experience where we have this big tent of a conference that um, is global. And then of course we have conference structures throughout the United States and regionalization and all that. And then we also have local conferences and then we have uh, the districts and then we have the churches. And so it's a, it's a not hierarchy, but it is a really powerful system of checks and balances that I'm appreciative to be a part of. And obviously I'm appreciative enough that I pursued ordination within this place. Right. So I, I definitely re respect um, the, the kind of discipline that it provides. Do you ever get any negative feedback from people that are like denomination, denominationally attached to other places or do you just kind of like miss all that? Um, do you mean like within the UMC or outside of UMC? Like people that like might be interested in checkpoint, but like, oh, well, my grandmother's a Baptist. So eh, like we are, we are thoroughly ecumenical. I think we have more people that react whenever they find out we're UMC, but I want to, I mean, I acknowledge the elephant in the room that we've had a rough couple of years in the news. Right. 
And so there's a chance that people have seen an article or have seen a mischaracterization or have seen some drama about the splinter and that kind of thing. And um, they get uncomfortable. And so I try my best to acknowledge that when I can, but I also am very clear with them that like, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to tell you, like, if you're going to join our discord, you better be joining the United Methodist church. Like that's, that's far be it for me to try and set those kind of expectations. Um, if I only wanted to reach Methodists, then I would be defying that purpose of the whole uh, reaching people outside of the church thing that I, you know, am trying to do. Um, yeah, of course, I want to. I want to encourage people to explore the same discipline and the same uh, discoveries that I've made within my denomination. Um, but I'm never going to turn anyone away. I think more people probably turn themselves away than I would ever turn them away. Um, with the future of Checkpoint. What do you what do you have a desire for that you don't feel like you have the bandwidth or capability for right now? Hmm. So many things. <laughs> that's like that's the endless question because I am. Uh, I don't know if you've ever taken the. Uh, oh gosh, what is it called? The strength strength finder? finders. Yeah. Yes, I don't know if you've taken that or not, but I am a strong ideation visionary. I am like I got ideas for days. I can keep coming up with things, and I have such a strong vision for checkpoint. And the only thing holding me back is those hours on the page. And uh, like I said, I'm very good at boundaries, and so that only makes it that much more difficult is that I'm I'm not going to give beyond my means, but who boy could I? And <laughs> Like, uh, who boy do I see some possibilities? Um, if I could dream a dream of Checkpoint, um, what I really want is I want us to be so full of, um, of communal experience that we are able to have somebody that is the Discord pastor, that is the Twitch pastor, that is the YouTube pastor. We have people that are there to serve that community intentionally with their full selves. Um, because I am divided um, between three major communities that we've chosen at this point uh, of YouTube, Discord, and Twitch. And that is hard. Like I said, if we have a 150 people limit, then obviously uh, I'm, I'm way overboard if you consider all three of those combined. Uh, and I, I feel like all three of those communities are so warranting of the reminder that God loves you, we love you matter, but I'm not able to give it to them to my maximum capacity. So that would be the real dream for me would be staffing to the point that we're able to adequately serve the people that we have. Um, and I think we're doing the best we can with what we've got with volunteers and with myself. Um, but any other church like this, uh, you would, you would see just a flood of, of staffing, um, and, a, and a long list of people that are serving this community professionally as professional Christians. And, uh, and we just don't, we don't have the bandwidth there. Um, do you feel like, so you don't have to get into too many specifics if it's a, a taboo or anything. Um, you are fully funded. Are you fully funded as a UMC pastor? Um, so we're like, a plant. And so the way that, the way that that works is we essentially have a grant. Um, and that grant lasts for about five years on the grant cycle. And so we're near the end of it. Um, and it's a sliding scale. And so we've, we've had, we had hundred percent funding for a few years and since it's waned. And so we still have plenty of other grants that we're tapping into. Um, we have ties that are, that are supporting us from within the community. We have Twitch payments. Now we're a YouTube partner. If we can get that pin in the mail, uh, then we can get support there as well. Um, and we're doing these check boxes. We're experimenting with new ways of sustainability. Um, but as far as things are concerned, the expectation of us is that we are fully sustainable. Um, is that we aren't needing these grants. Um, and while the UMC is more than supportive of it, and there's also extension you know, beyond the UMC of people who are equally supportive of it, uh, it, it just becomes a real challenge to figure out how are we going to make this thing. Uh, like I said, I, I want to prove that digital ministry is possible. I don't want to prove that it's possible by donors. I want to prove that it's possible by the community that exists. And, uh, and that's a, that's a tough thing to e experience. That's a tough thing to make happen. Um, cause I know church plants that are 15 years old that are still figuring out how to sustain. Uh, and that's, that's just the reality of, uh, I know churches that have existed for a hundred years and are figuring out how to sustain. So, uh, mm -hmm. it's not an easy thing to do, but it is a thing that I I'm, I'm firmly committed to figuring out how we can make sure this works. Ideally, what I'd want to do eventually is charter. So chartering within our within our structure means that we would uh, get a board and membership and we would become our own 501c3 and have a, an, an official representation um, as, a, as a, a, a church tax exempt people. And uh, for us to do that, um, we have to get to a critical size and sustainability that we're able to do those things. Um, 
And while we're there in a lot of ways, we're not there in all the ways. And that's a challenge until we can get there. But at that point, not only would we, as the part of the connectional system that is the UMC, not only would we be expected to support the pastors that we have um, and the operation costs, we would also be expected to give back into a thing that we call apportionments. Um, and so we would be expected to pay in to the big tent that is the UMC so that we can do more uh, ministry as a connection. Uh, and so it's like, it's it's a, a, a far way off but it's stories like the has-been hotel stories. It's stories like those comments. It's uh, the reminders of the good ministry that we're doing that kind of gives me the energy to keep pushing forward and explore new options of how we're going to make this work because I just believe in this ministry with everything that I have. Do you, um, you don't have to share it, but do you have a number in mind of what it would take for you to bring other staff on? Ooh. No, I don't. I wish that I did. Um, we're really at the point where we do have a budget. Uh, we've officially kind of drafted what we um, what we've done the past four years and reflected on it and seen like, okay, here's our averages. Here's what we need to sustain. Um, and then, of course, we have my my uh, kind of mandated salary via the conference and the structure that says, all right, you're an ordained elder. This is how much we expect uh, in Social Security and all that. But we can't reach that yet. And so I feel like how could we how can we support a staff if we aren't quite yet able to meet the expectations that we have set upon ourselves? Okay. Um, for me, what it would really come down to would probably be finding a grant uh, and finding a grantor to support a staffing position, which is rare. Uh, but I don't think it's impossible. I actually wrote a, a I, I don't know if I should say, but I wrote to, to a particular um, uh, charitable giver about the possibility of like, hey, will you support interns? Like, can you support interns for us? Because uh, nobody else is doing this and I'll train them. You know, you pay them, I'll train them. Uh, I don't care. I'll do that work and uh, and I'll get the help that I need from it. And so we had uh, we had one particular college that hopped on that last year. And I just had such a good experience with training up an intern that I was like, I can do this again. And I could do it with 10 of them. Like, let's talk about it. Let's make a staff of interns paid for by a grantor um, that is in a, in a way supporting the future uh, of, of ministry. So who knows, who knows what people will do and what they'll go with. I'm going to keep writing letters and keep on talking to people and rubbing elbows and saying that this is the future that is possible for the church and whether it's the future or not, it is making a huge impact here and now. And so we need to celebrate that and uh, equip people with what we've got. So all of the, all the vision, all the praises you've seen, just ask this, um, where is your biggest backlash been or criticism been? Because I know that like for still, I know where we're at, but I also know that, you know, you mentioned digital church to, you know, some people you're going to get lo much less than love. So where, where does that sit for you? Yeah. Yeah. I, the, thankfully the UMC for the most part has been very supportive. But I do think that if I experience pushback, it is ironically from the Christians. Uh, and it frustrates me to no end that the church just insists on eating itself uh, and insists on putting others down instead of celebrating the work that uh, the Holy Spirit is doing in ways that we don't understand. Um, and so that is, that's a real stressor. Uh, for me. And I have to, I have to do my best that I possibly can to let those things kind of go in one ear and out the other. Whenever we have somebody that's a particularly powerful naysayer, um, you know, if they're trying to distract from the, from the real call of what we're doing because of something that they disagree with, then, you know, we're just, we're doing too much important work to let that drag us down and, and keep us, keep us distracted from uh, the mission that we really have in front of us. Uh, and so any backlash that we receive, I kind of try to receive it as generously as I can. I respond when and if I am able. And at a certain point, I think you got to kind of kick the dust off your boots and move on um, from some people that are simply just not going to be swayed. Uh, you know, I can I can continue to tell stories and I can continue to tell things that are going well. And if if those folks want to hear those stories and see the evidence of ministry, um, then they'll have to open their eyes. But otherwise, what more can I do? So, I mean, and it's on a very small scale thing of like, um, I hosted a Comic-Con at my church building uh, in person in September. Um, and we did it like we had a threefold goal when we did it was one, um, bless and support the artist community. So we made it all the artists, all the vendors were free to set up stuff. You know, there were no fees with that. Um we wanted to provide an outreach space to connect with our community more. And 
we wanted to uh, just try and reach different people than we had ever reached. Uh, oh. And so I pitched it to my, I work with a pastoral team of about seven guys, like across different areas and of three different like church locations and um, pitched it, said, Hey, I'm doing this. I'm not asking a lot of you. I just need you to show up and I need you to support. So all of my staff, all of the guys I work with are like, go for it. Not all of them are muggles and that's fine. Um, I didn't expect a ton from them, but they, they gave it their best and they really served out. And um, we ended up like our physical building is not a huge building. It's like not like our at one time capacity is about 150 in our sanctuary space or auditorium space. So we do two services on Sundays and because we can't hold a ton. Um, we ended up with like 30 vendors and uh, artists and I'm not saying it was a perfect day, but it was a really good day. And uh, the thing that we saw was that we had 248 people that attended that aren't a part of our congregation at all that have never set foot in our building before never connected with us before. And I was like, I was on such a high from Mm -hmm. like just the fruit that I was seeing with this. And I found that one of the people in my congregation who I've given the most effort to serve the most with like literally right now, when I get off the phone with you or get off the zoom with you, uh, I have to call that person because they had to go to the hospital this week. And I need to check up on them. But I found that that one person had been going over my head as far as he could go to try and make sure it didn't, wasn't allowed to happen. Mm. Like hand shaking my hand on Sunday. And then like, mm. we can't do this. It's wrong. But like, and they're like, be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> and, but it's just like, it's so hard to do, to even take us. Even if people just have a different opinion, it's hard to take, when people are just shooting shots at what you find so valuable, even if they don't get the vision, um, how do you, uh, what do you, what's your process like for, you know, not letting that hit you when it does happen. I just literally just did a nerdy sermon on pretty much this exact topic. Um, I was talking about X-Men 97 and kind of the, the backlash that people have had to it. And, uh, I just talked a little bit about this sentiment that we have to just tear each other apart. And often the people that come at me for the things that we talk about, whenever we talk about TV shows and cartoons and anime, people come at me all the time talking about anime is of the devil. I'm so tired of it. Um, but what I do is more often than not, uh, those people are doing it from a very spiritual stance. Um, and I just assume that they kind of, uh, they, they use the, the phrase, the enemy a lot. Um, they're, they're the people that are very much kind of focused on these dark and spiritual forces and spiritual warfare. And I remind people, uh, because they also typically like Lewis. So I say, do you remember, uh, do you remember what screw tape told Wormwood about not getting involved? Because often the humans will tear themselves apart without the devil and the demons ever having to show up. And so I throw that story in pretty regularly um, to just kind of, kind of hopefully get their attention of like, if you really believe that there's spiritual warfare going on, um, I just think that it's so much more evidenced in uh, the deceit and the, the kind of uh, degradation of our own desire to tear each other to pieces um, and to lambast and to go out in public whenever we've been given instructions of how to handle dissent. We've been given destruction, uh, instruction of like, reach out in private, then bring a powerful leader with you, then bring them before the church and then treat them like a tax collector, which still, you know, that doesn't say necessarily too much to throw them out. Uh, like we've been given instructions on how to deal with people that we disagree with. And yet we instead become sneaky and we become secretive and we become harmful. And so we have a rule in our community. Um, we use John Wesley's general rules uh, to do good, to do no harm, and to strive to grow. And so do no harm is one that I throw pretty often into the faces of the naysayers is I say, let's, let's, let's think about how we're doing harm here. Um, as soon as people start throwing out ad hominems, 
uh, about some, some people groups uh, or about some of the shows that we watch or anything like that, I say, Hey, look, that's a, that's a direct example of do no harm. I'm deleting that message. Uh, and that's like a, that's a ground rule that I have for myself and for the conversations that we have. I'm open to any discussion. There's nothing that's off the table um, in our community. I'll take any questions. Um, but what I'm not going to accept is people doing harm to each other because I think that that is, if you are a spiritual warfare proponent, that is a direct example of uh, uh, some warfare being done in our hearts and us tearing each other apart. When you mentioned the tax collector thing too, like, cause uh, that passage and the passage also about if you remember that you have something against your brother, leave your yes. gift at the altar, those two. But one of the things that really hit me uh, just kind of studying with the tax collector thing is, you know, when you, it's just to treat them as a tax collector. It's, I feel and this is just as, my reflection on it, I guaranteeing anything past that. But like one of the things that you deal when you treat someone as a tax collector is you treat them like they don't know better. Mm-hmm. Like if you've, if you've tried to explain it and you've uh, addressed it personally, it's just like, they're not at a point where they can actually understand the spiritual end of things right now because they are bound up in worldly ways. And it's just like, okay, they don't understand the language. They, they're not getting this. So it's yeah. like, and rather than treat them like the an enemy, treat them like, okay, you just don't get it. <laughs> and that's helped me a little bit. Um, so I want to be a good respecter of your time and everything, but it's uh, anything else about checkpoint you want to share with us, anything you want to tell us um, that we should take away from the heart of this. Sure. So specifically to, to the audience of this podcast, cause I think they'll get something out of this at some point in our ministry, we like acknowledge that we were creating these nerdy sermons, but that not everyone that watches these nerdy sermons needs a church. Um, not everyone that watches these, uh, because they really want to hear about X-Men 97 wants to go join the checkpoint church community. Maybe they're already a part of love thy nerd. Um, maybe they're a part of the, the faith and fandom universe. Maybe they are already a part of their own local church or they have a small group or a young adult group or a life group, you know, fill in the blank. Um, but we wanted to create some way for people to have the conversations that we're having in our discord community in their own communities. And so we created this thing called Jesus Loves Nerds. Um, It is a Bible study curriculum. So if you go to jesuslovesnerds.com, which is a a URL that I'm still amazed that I was able to get. Right. uh, But (laughs) jesuslovesnerds.com, you can go and access, we have a Substack feed um, and you can access every sermon that we've uh, written since that launched is on there and has a curriculum that coordinates with it. We've got questions, we've got prayers, um, we've got you know uh, an act, spiritual activity, we've got a group activity, we've got everything that you could possibly need. We've even got, for people that aren't nerds, uh, I try to break down some of the nerdy theological terms that are in there um, just to provide some more framework. Um, and so that is what we've created. And um, I encourage you to use that, bring that to your small groups, especially if you like our nerdy sermons, because it's just an opportunity to dive deeper into those things. And I do want to be totally upfront that um, we put out one free one every single month, but that this is a subscription that we're also trying to sustain our ministry with. Um, So we're happy to provide it uh, for free once a month, but then we also uh, are are hopeful that you'll consider supporting the ministry that we're doing as well if you want a weekly um, curriculum brought to you with all of our nerdy sermons. So that's something that is out there. And I'll tell you a secret. If you want to know a secret, I'm not supposed to tell this. It's kind of like that moment in The Incredibles where like the boss doesn't want Bob to tell everybody the secrets of the insurance agency. Um, if you subscribe to our Substack, you will get access to all of the ones we've ever released. And I don't know if you've copy and pasted them. So that's all that I'll say. Um, you know, just feel do with that information what you will. I don't want you to do that because I want you to support <laughs> Checkpoint and I believe in it. Um, but, you know they do all become available then. And I don't think Substack has done anything to prevent that. So uh, that's what I'll say about Jesus Loves Nerds. And if you do consider doing that, please let me know because I would love to support you and shout you out and um, you know do whatever I can to, to celebrate that you're taking advantage of that resource that we're creating. But I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that. That's awesome. And they can find you at Checkpoint Church everywhere. Yep. Linktree slash Checkpoint Church, Linktree slash Nerd Pastor Nate. Those are going to be my my two feeds that should have pretty much everything that we're doing. Um, If you want to get involved at Checkpoint Church, like I mentioned, Twitch, Discord, YouTube, those are our three main platforms. If you go find us on Facebook, you're going to see one post every four or five months. Um, And that's, you know, just we don't focus on all the others. I can't. Uh, So if you want to experience us, Twitch, Discord, YouTube, that's where you're going to find uh, the real meat of our community. You got to know what your pain with is, man. Um, That's right. Uh, before we bounce, uh, we'll let you know, you can find more of 
these interviews over at lovethynerd.com slash faith and fandom uh, from nerd pastor Nate to professional wrestlers to uh, horror authors to uh, voice actors. We've had some really cool folks on uh, this content for the past year. Um, you can find those there first. Um, also to let you know that our podcast, uh, along with several other Love Thy Nerd podcasts, are now streaming on the GLU network, GLU network, which is a streaming platform available on Roku and smart TVs as iPhones, Androids, etc. Um, the, there's an app, the GLU app which unlocks it, but the whole purpose is to unlock uh, inspirational value of faith-centric programming and partnering with Christian creators like Love Thy Nerd and Faith Thy, Faith and Fandom, etc. So if you want to check that out, you can find this podcast and other ones over there. Um, but Nate, uh, thanks for taking time to talk with me and chat with me, you know. And I still think one of my favorite things of last year was randomly running into you at a con, like right? in, the, in the middle of bum like middle of nowhere north carolina <laughs> i was just like wait what um that was pretty cool uh are you Absolutely. still part of connecting with them there uh, i mean i'll go back again this year but yeah i'm 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 not too far from there and so it's it's a good it's a good spot to be even if it is in the middle of nowhere we have a cheesecake yeah. place now and it's really good i, I <laughs> that's awesome um i think that day is the day that five iron frenzy is going to play in atlanta so I'm going to uh, respectfully bow out of that show for because I miss Five Iron Frenzy and I'm going to go see them there. Uh, but thanks. And uh, so everybody, thanks for taking time to listen. Make sure you check out Nate and all of his fantastic content. And we hope to see you soon.